welcome friends to this final session of the final day of our two day event in Stockholm, Sweden. Once again, I'm very happy to see all of you here. I will tell you finally that the spiritual path does not consist of any mental effort. It's a path of love and devotion, period. That is why these perfect living masters, they come and the more we associate with them, the more we understand what they are doing. They are pulling us with their love and they, their love is pure, unconditional and different from what we call love here. They become friends. They hold your hand. They stay with you forever. Once they say, we accept you as a friend, they never leave us, no matter what. Impossible. That's the kind of love and friendship they have. Sometimes we cannot fully understand them because at the same time, they are ordinary human beings. At the same time, they are having extraordinary love. Sometimes the combination confuses us, but they clarify it over time. I'll give you one example of a very dear friend of mine who was a disciple of this great master. His name was Dr. Isha Singh. He was a veterinary doctor. That means he treated animals. When he heard about Great Master, he was a seeker for a long time. And living in a small town called Kapoorthala in India, which was not too far, about 20 miles, 25 miles away, from the Dera, the ashram, the place where Great Master lived. But he had never heard of him except from his neighbors who were Muslims. They followed Islam. And he was a Sikh. He followed the Sikh religion. Two religions which are different. But one day he asked those Muslim neighbors, what makes you so happy all the time? They said, it is happiness is coming from a man with a white beard who lives not too far from here. That excited him that I should go and find him. He said, where does he live? They said, along the river Bias, which is not far from here, along the river Bias, on one side, he lives in a very small hut with two rooms. That hut was built by his master named Baba Jamal Singh, and he is a busy man. He's working as an engineer, comes only on weekends, and gives a discourse in the evening on Saturdays, and goes back to his work on Sunday. He is working very far away. If you go on a Saturday, you can see him. So this doctor took off after his work on a Saturday, on a bike, bicycle, and drove along the river Bias. He was told it's only about three miles downstream. So he drove on his bicycle, rode his bicycle for three miles, saw no building or anything there. He drove a little more that maybe in India, sometimes three miles is very differently described. The difference is, if you ask him how far is the place, they say three miles. After you go three miles, you ask how far the place, they say three miles. They're consistent. <laughs> but the, the three miles does not really mean physically three miles. He thought maybe he has been told three miles in that context, and so he kept on going. He went about nine miles, and nothing happened. It got dark in the evening. And he asked a man when he saw a ferry there, a ferry to cross the river to the other side. 
and asked the ferryman, where is that Dera where a white bearded man lives and tells us about spiritual path? He said, oh, you are on the wrong side of the river. He's on the other side of the river. And that's only three miles from that main road from which you came. He said, can you take me by ferry on the other side so I can go up six miles to go to that Dera? He said, there is no population there. There is no pathways even. It's all a forest. The ferry is being used only for a village because there is no way to go from the other side up north. So you try to go back and go in the morning. He said, no, it's very important I reach on Saturday. The man is there only on Saturday. He persuaded the ferryman. Doesn't matter. I'll walk. I'll go through the forest. I'll go through the uh, thorny plants there. Doesn't matter. So the ferryman agreed to take him across the river. And when he went across the river, he had to carry his bicycle on his head, no place even to drag it. And he began to struggle, trying to keep near the river so he doesn't get lost, and took him several hours to go a few miles. Early morning, dawn was coming, light could be seen coming in the sky, and he reached and found that little hut a two-roomed little place. And he knocked on the door. And an old lady opened the door. And he said, I have come to see the master. And she used the most offensive vulgar language to scold him. You have no sense. Is this the time to come and disturb the master? Go away. And he she was so angry, he had been told by his Muslim neighbors, there is a lady there, very dedicated lady. She has spent time not only with this master, she has spent time with his master's master. Not only that, she is initiated by master's master's master from Agra. So when he saw this lady's anger, he said, this lady has spent her life with three masters and her anger is so bad. What will I get here? The useless place. And he went back. In the morning, he told his Muslim neighbors, I went and to, to your master. He is not a master at all. Because the lady there who you mentioned was named Bibi Rukko. That Bibi Rukko, that lady came out and she used such offensive language, and she was so angry just for my trying to go and meet the master. If a lady who has spent all her life with masters can't even lose her anger, what will I get from there? And his Muslim neighbor smiled and said, he played a trick on you again. He said, what do you mean trick again? What's the trick? He said, did you go to see the master or the lady? I went to see the master. Did you see him? No. Then how can you say that what kind of master he is? That lady is a very kind, gentle lady. When you go next time, she'll be totally different. It's a trick testing you. The master has tested you. You failed. Try again. He realized that there is some truth in this, that I didn't see the master at all. And I'm rejecting a master on the behavior of a lady. Maybe I should not look at anybody. When I want to see a master, I should look at the master. Nobody else. Therefore, he decided to go again. This time he knew where to go. So he went another Saturday in good time on his horse, this time on his horse. And he saw the master sitting outside the hut in the evening. And he went and he said, Master, I have come to receive something. Oh, by the way, this second visit he made with the owner of the land around that area, the chief of that area. So actually, before he could have the discussion, I forgot to mention, he went and the master was still having the discourse, five o'clock discourse in the evening. And he went on his horse, and his uh, chief of the land, who was also 
a sort of a horse owner whose horses this doctor used to attend to. So the chief and he both went. First the chief wasn't willing to go. He said it's not a good place to go to. That man has some magical powers. And anybody who goes there doesn't come back. So it's not a good place to go. But then he persuaded the chief, you go, we'll just, it's your land. He's just sitting in a corner near the river. So they both went. And the master was giving a discourse at that time. So Isha Singh got off the horse, tied the horse and stood there with the chief next to him. And great master saw them standing. So he waved to them like this. Come here, come along. So Isha Singh said, the master knows you, chief, it's your land. He's calling you. Chief said, no, he's not calling me, he's calling you. He said, how do we know? How do you know? He said, well, you let's separate. And the chief went on one side and the Isha Singh doctor went on the other side, and the great master looked at both. Then he turned toward Isha Singh and said, come. So Isha Singh went forward, and the chief left. Isha Singh sat, uh, was going to sit at the back, and master had a book in his hand, and he opened the book, then closed it, and put it on the, on the table, and asked him, come sit in front. Now this is his first visit where he saw the master. So he came and sat in front and master opened the book, read some verses from it and then explained what they mean. As he explained, Isha Singh said, he is answering all my questions. He knows my questions at least. As it went on for half an hour, he said, now I know. This master has a magical book. All the secrets are in this book. And therefore, I know why he's so important a magician, because he's got the book, magic book. When the discourse was over, he stood up. Master, can I borrow that book you have? Master said, no, I don't. I can't lend it because I need to read it. But master, can I borrow just for a week? When you come back, next week, I'll give it back to you. Master said, no, I sometimes in the middle of the week also like to read it. He said, master, can you give me the book just for tonight? I'll read it tonight and give it to you in the morning. Great master said, no, you know, I sometimes get up in the middle of the night and have to read the book. He got convinced the whole secret is in the book. He said, Master, I have 75 rupees in my pocket. That's all I'm carrying, my wealth. I'll give you all 75 if you give me that book. Great Master said, if you give me a million rupees, I won't give you the book. <laughs> he got absolutely convinced. <laughs> this is the secret he has. He said, what kind of master are you? You can't even show the book to me? No, 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 I use it all the time. Very disappointed. He went back. And the next morning he told his neighbors, I now know what the secret of the master is. He has a book. And I saw the name on the book. And that's a magic book. It's called Sar Bachan. They said, what? Sar Bachan book is available for two rupees in the market. <laughs> you can go and buy it. It's the same book. And he went and saw the book is being sold everywhere. <laughs> so he realized that the master did something very unusual. He read the book and he was impressed by the conversation that we had and he decided to go again. Once again he went to master at the second visit and he says, Master, I have read the book. I know you just played a trick on me by saying you can't give it to me. It's available. And I noticed that the real secret which you are using is called Nam, initiation. That when a master gives initiation, then he promises to take that disciple 
to a true home. Give me initiation. Give me Nam, the one that's mentioned in the book and the one you talk about. I want to go to my true home. Great Master said, have you broken your arm? He said, is that a requirement for getting initiated? Great Master said, not a requirement. It just so happens that the time in your destiny when you have to get initiated is after you break your arm and get it repaired, get it healed, come back to me. But Master, he said, Master, why should I break my arm? He said, you don't have to break it, it'll break by itself <laughs> through an accident. You ride horses, don't you? You can fall off from a horse and break your arm. He said, Master, I've been riding horses all my life. Why should I fall off from a horse? He said, well, these accidents happen. Nobody can predict them. You break your arm, get healed. You come back, I will initiate you. Promise. He went back. And his wife, when he reached his wife, whose name was Maya, she said, where have you been all day? The prince of Kapoorthala has been calling you all day, he sent so many messages. Maybe some horse of his, some camel, elephant, he has so many animals, has fallen sick. Run to the palace and go and see him. And he ran to the palace. And the prince of Kapoorthala, the ruler of Kapoorthala state, he was sitting on his throne. Where have you been, doctor? All day I've been wanting to wanting you to come. From morning I'm waiting for you. He said, sir, I'd gone to see a Maharaj. He said, what Maharaj? I am the Maharaj. <laughs> what name are you using? There's no Maharaj. No, it's a white bearded saint. And he has promised to initiate me, to give me now. He said, don't be confused, you're an educated person, you're a doctor. Now, let me tell you why I was waiting for you. Only this morning, <clears throat> I have received two horses from Saudi Arabia. Pure breed Arabian horses. And I have been waiting that I will not inaugurate the ride on these horses till Isha Singh comes. We'll both go together. Bring the horses. Isha Singh says, excuse me, I don't want to ride. <laughs> he said, what has happened to you? Every day you ride with me. No, that saint told me I'll break my arm. <laughs> so you believe in these superstitions? These are superstitions these people create and mislead you. Oh, come, sit on the horse with me. Please forgive me today. All right, the prince said, for saving my face, all the court has been waiting for it, just get on the horse. I'll get on the horse. I'll ride off, you can get off and go home. He said, okay. The prince sat on the horse. He said, he got on the horse. As soon as he got on the horse, the horse shot off. <laughs> and was new, struck a little stone or pebble, fell, he said, he fell underneath multiple fractures of his right arm. <laughs> Same night when he had come back from the master. He said, that master knows everything. <laughs> anyway, it was a multiple fracture. <coughs> it affected right his shoulder <coughs> and lasted longer. So sort of three weeks or so, it lasted six weeks. But after six weeks, they removed the plaster. But it, there was some kind of, I think some kind of calci calcification or something. He could not move his arm much, even after the plaster was taken off. But he went back to get master. Master, I broken my arm and healed and come to initiation. He said, raise your ha right hand to your ear. He says, master, I can't do that. Sorry, I can't give you down. <laughs> what, every time I come, you impose a new condition? No, not a new condition. I told you very last time. I said, go and break your arm and get healed and come back. You're not healed. But master, this is a permanent calcification. I can't actually do anything about it. 
He says, when your horses get injured, do you kill them or do you save them with some treatment? He said, I have a treatment which is very painful. I use very strong acids on the broken place and the horses have to scream and they hit the ground, they make a hole in the ground, it's so bad and painful. Great Master said, why don't you try it on yourself? <laughs> Master, you want to kill me? What is this? No, no, you can dilute the acid and try it. Then when they were healed, come back to me. With all this thing, he got healed, went back, got initiated, became one of his most beloved disciples. And I loved him, and most people loved this man. But he heard in a discourse, he said, great master said, if a person has even seen a perfect living master once, it's guaranteed he'll be initiated by some master someday. The darshan of a perfect living master is so important. When he heard that, he said, my dad doesn't believe in masters at all. If I can just make him see the master once, I'll be happy. I'll have done my service as a son to my father. So he told his dad, dad, you know I go and follow that master with a white beard. I want you to come and see him. Dad said, no way. I don't believe, according to my religion, my book, the Guru Granth Sahib, is my master. And I only acknowledge that as my master. No human being can be a master anymore. And I cannot go and see anybody. He said, Dad, you can just accompany me sometime. No, I will not go and see that man at all who pretends to be a master. Only my book is a master. <coughs> he tried so many times to persuade him. The dad said, no way. Then he said, let me play a trick. He came to great master. He said, master, I understand. Tomorrow you are going to another town by train. And, and I know you arrive 10 or 15 minutes before the train time. If I bring somehow my dad to the train station with some excuse, will you see him and give your darshan to him? Great master said, of course. So when the day came, and great master was at the platform on the station. He went to his dad in the morning. Dad, I have to go and have some business with the station master there, the super station superintendent. Would you like to come along for a ride? Dad said, OK. So they both came on horses. And he said, Dad, will you hold my horse while I go and meet the station superintendent, and I'll come back? Of course. So he had the reins of uh, Isha Singh's horse. And she saying, ran down, because the platform was like that, that it, you had to go down the steps to reach the platform. He ran down, and great master was there, people were around him, and he said, Master, I have brought Bapu, you know, he used to call his dad Bapu, I have brought Bapu here, he's up there, would you like to see him? Oh, sure. And they're both running up. You know, the whole, whole of disciples are watching, great master, the doctor, running up. What has happened? They ran up, but the father suspected there is something going on here, and this son has not returned. He's probably arranged some trick. So by the time they reached the top, the dad had escaped and gone away. So he could not see great master. Then the idea came to him, an idea which I don't recommend to you, by the way. An idea came to him that why can't I just carry my dad there? Early morning one day, he brought a long rope. And while the dad was sleeping, he tied him up on the bed. <laughs> now those beds are quite light, which they use. And so he was a strong man. He arranged a horse cart to come in the morning to take, us, take the dad to the Dera, a long 20 mile ride. Uh, and therefore, when he tied his dad, dad said, what are you doing, son? I am taking you to my master. <laughs> Is this the way to take to a master? Are you mad? <coughs> what has happened to you? But he said, now you have no choice. I am going to take you. He put, put, put up the little bed on his head. Master tied on, his father tied on it, went out. 
and put him on that horse cart. The father screamed, my son has gone mad. What's happening? All the neighbors came out. He said, doctor, what's happened? He said, my father got crazy, so I'm taking him to a hospital. <laughs> the father said, I am not mad, he's mad. <laughs> they all said, take him quickly. <laughs> now imagine the scene at the Dera, great master sitting on a chair, and the man screaming and tied up on a horse cart, and his son riding a horse next to it, arriving there. And when they both reached there, great master got up. He said, what's going on? And he said, he got from the horse. He said, I brought my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you said, bring him to me is your job. Initiating him is my job. He said, I brought him. Great master said, are you mad that you have to bring your dad like this? And dad said, that's what I've been telling him. <laughs> He said, you mad fellow, you brought your dad like this? He told the sevala who around him, untie the man and take him inside, put some balm. Look, he's injured himself with the rope around him. Take him inside. So they took the dad inside and Isha Singh said, I don't know what will happen next. After a few minutes, great master comes out, quietly whispers to him, go away for three days and come back after three days. Isha Singh thought, well, with my dad, three days mean nothing. <laughs> three months will mean nothing here. <laughs> what will happen in three days? Anyway, he left. <coughs> when he came back after three days, he saw a great master sitting on the chair outside and his dad standing in front like this. He rubbed his eyes to see if it is his dad. And then he as it happened, his horse dirtied that place where it came. And so the dad took his shirt off to clean the place. He said, you are still mad. You don't realize in the presence of a great master, you are causing this dirt over here. He said, Bapu, is that you? <laughs> he said, you have no idea who this man is. He is the one described in our book. He is the one who is called the Param Sad Sadguru. He is a real perfect master. You are mad, you don't have no idea about it. And look at it. Only I was so fortunate this morning I got initiated from him. Quite a story. Now he lived this, he was a doctor, very small means, small salary he would get from the state. And there were big people living in that city. One was a judge. And he had also been finance minister of the state. And his name was Dariyai Lal. Another important person who had a big house there was a professor called Professor Bhatnagar. These two had big houses there. And this man lived in a very small room, in a small lane, and with no really facilities there. This Easter thing, after many months, when he became so good, friendly with the great master, he said, Master, you do all your work here. Why don't you come to our little town and give a discourse to poor people who live there, who don't have, don't have the means and the time to come here? Great master said, certainly, Easter thing, I'll come to your place. He said, thank you very much. Great master agreed to come visit me in my place. Then he told those rich people, you have a car, and they had an old car. They can you borrow your car, and can you bring? Oh, great master agreed to come to our town. Certainly we'll give you the car, whatever facilities you want. So, Dariyai Lal's car was arranged, the rich man's car was arranged, and great master traveled from his own house, accompanied by Darila, owner of the car. And Isha Singh told all the neighbors in that lane and elsewhere, all great master coming to our house, please clean it up. Because outside the house where he lived, they had cows and buffaloes and animals tied up and they were dirty. So there were 50, 40, 50 sevadars, disciples, 
all began to clean up the place. And they're working hard to clean up for the great master is coming. We should have a clean place for him to stay. Eventually, the car came. And, and Isha Singh was standing at that lane waiting for him to tell him that this is the way to turn the car. And other people were with him. They all folding hands, waiting. And the car didn't stop. The car went ahead. He said, what happened? Master was supposed to be coming and staying here. And the car went ahead. And the Riyalal said, Master, I have prepared a bedroom for you. And I prepared proper meals for you. I have made all the arrangements for your stay. And the professor has also made it your choice. Professor also wants you to stay there. I'll take you to my house. So Great Master said, certainly I'd like to meet your family member. So they stopped at the Riyalal's house. And he went out outside the car. All the family members met. They put their head on his feet, like they used to do. And he blessed them. And then they said, shall we take your bags up, Master? He said, no, leave them in the car. They said, maybe he had decided to stay with the professor, but Nagar. So they drove off to the professor's house. Meanwhile, what is happening to Ishar Singh? He says, these rich people have taken master away. I thought he's a poor man's master. He's rich people's master. Just because they have a car, just because they have good houses, they have snatched the master and taken him away. How can he be my friend? What happened to him? All the disciples who were around him said, you are a fool, you should have realized you don't have any arrangement to put up the master. You only one single room, no bathroom, nothing. How will the master stay here? You are mistaken that he'll come and stay with you. And they all ran. They said, at least he's going to give a darshan to everybody in a, in a large park. Let's go to the park. He said, I'm not going to the park. You go. Everybody left to see the master in the park. And he stood there. His wife, who was with him, said, you have always been a foolish person, stupid person, thinking master will come here. I am also leaving. He said, you also leave. Everybody leave. Just leave me alone. And he got inside his room, bolted it from inside, began to cry. Master, what is this? I thought you were my friend. But these rich people have just stolen you away, taken you away. What is happening on the other hand? They reach Professor Bhatnagar's house, and same thing happens. He gets down, greets the family member. They say, shall we take your bag? He said, no. He said, poor Easter Singh is crying. Take me back there. They said, Master, he has no proper house. He said, he has a house. Master, it is not a house. He said, how does he live if it's not a house? Master, there's no bathroom there. Well, he also takes a bath somewhere. Master, he just picks up a bucket of water and goes up on the roof. So I can also do that. And he persuaded them, drive the car back. So he drives the car back. And only Shadi, who was his bodyguard, is with him. And one secretary was with him. He stops the car at the beginning of the lane, said, nobody follow me. I'll go alone. And he walks up the lane and knocks on the door of Isha Singh's house. Isha Singh thinks some other satsangi has come to call me. Go away, go away, I don't want to see anybody. He said, Isha Singh, this is me, Savan Singh. When he hears Master's voice, he opens the door. Master walks in, hugs him, and shuts the door himself, and says, I am your friend. I will never leave you. This is the kind of friendship Master could show. A true story. And when we remember both of them almost having tears, hugging as friends, he said, I will stay here. I will have a bath upstairs like you do. I will go to the nearby public place for toilets. I will be holding satsang in the place you have cleaned up. And the first time Great Master ever traveled outside was in that place. He's just saying, was so touched by the love of his master. Masters can show their love in so many ways. 
after great master passed away and many years later i moved on to united states got a fellowship to study at harvard university later on i went retired from the indian government and went up there lived there and became friends with many disciples one disciple said can you take me back to india and make me meet some real real good disciples of the great master i like to see how they do and i thought i should make him see isher singh so that disciple who was a disciple of another master in united states his name was roy corl he is also passed away so i can tell his name roy corl and i we traveled to india together i took him to the dera showed him where we were where i lived where our house was and i said now i'll take you to the man who impressed me so much with his love for the master i took him to the house of isher singh there i said this is a doctor i tell stories about he tied up his dad and took him to master he is the one who broke his arm he is the one oh, i reminded him of all the stories and isher singh said this man has come all the way from america to see me i said yes i told him i'll show him a good disciple a great master i said i was not a good enough example so i said i'll show you a real example so i brought him here and i said this disciple was given a very special gift by great master great master once gave his own shoes he said isher singh i have used these shoes would you like to take them certainly master and i said he has great master shoes he said roy call said to isher singh can i please have a look at those shoes he said i don't normally let anybody see you come thousands of miles away i will show you so he opened up the closet and wrapped in nice clothes right silk were two old shoes roy call looked at the shoes put his head on the shoe like this he should think at tears in his eyes to see an american coming and doing this to shoes of his master he was so touched he asked me what shall i do for this man i am i owe him a lot for showing his love for my master's shoe i said you have entertained him here is good enough it's great that we could see you he said no when he retired from his job the prince of kapurthala the raja maharaja of kapurthala had given him a gold braided cloak which the prince used to use so he made a gold thread all of it that was the most expensive thing which he gave him as a retirement gift he said thing went and opened up the other closet and took out that and he said this is the minimum i can give him so he said you have shown respect to my master's shoes i have nothing to give you except this little piece and he gave him that old cloak to him he was roy call put on the cloak i look like a maharaja take my photos so we took lot of photos of him and i saw that picture of tears in that man's eyes how much he was still remembering master how the shoes were kept there just to remember master every day so it was a remarkable sight i am telling you this story just to tell you how master's love affects us and how there are some incidents that happen in our life which we can never forget some incident that happen which at that time don't look so great I'm tempted to tell you one incident of my own. I normally wouldn't say too much, but I can tell you. I've told it earlier, I think, to some people. I was initiated when I was young. I was initiated on 9th of March, 1936. I was nine and a half years old. <coughs> I was taken by my grandfather to get initiated, and, and in those days, great master used to give to young children. half initiation if you are very young he would just tell you how to listen to the sound inside and if you were teenagers he would tell you how to repeat the mantra 
and when you made some progress, you'd go back for the second half. If either you had learned how to listen to the sound, he would give you the mantra, and if you had got the mantra or Simran, he'd then give you how to listen to the sound. So my grandfather took me to great master and said, I brought him from half for half to say, half initiation. And great master held me by the arm and said, what kind of initiation do you want? Salted or sugared sweet? Now I had seen him do that with other children. I didn't know children would say sweet. And he had a little candy always with him. He would give them a candy, they'd run away. So I knew he's playing the same trick on me now. I said, no, I don't want sugar and salt. I want what is in here. So he laughed and didn't say anything, but kept his hold on my arm and pulled me just one side because he was selecting other people for initiation. I thought maybe I'd be rejected, but his grip was strong. I couldn't run away. And I said, why does he let me go if he hasn't decided to say yes to me? Anyway, when the selection process was over, he said to me, you will get full initiation, come inside. And said, sit right in front of me. I sat right in front of him, I'm probably the youngest person in that group. And he gave initiation. I can remember his words and his voice right now. Because he said the opening words were powerful for me. He said, what I am going to give you, I got from your master, Abba Jamal Singh. It worked for me. I hope what I give you will work for you. If it does not, you are free to choose anything you like. You are free to go and find something better than what I am giving you. You don't have to come back to me for permission. I grant you permission in advance. But please do me one favor. If you find something better, please come and tell me what you found. I will also go and take it. Great Master's words. That openness of what he was teaching had never left me till today. There was nothing to bind you down. I knew not a cult, not a closed society at all. He's openly saying, you can go where you like. I'm telling you a method. I'm telling you a way. And if you don't like it, doesn't work for you, go. I still remember that. So I tried to initiate, I tried to meditate according to his initiations. And I used to hear strange sounds when I was a child, four year old, I used to hear. I used to think of extraordinary things, we are not real, maybe something is real, there's thoughts. All those experiences disappeared after I got initiated. Whatever I thought was spiritual disappeared on the very day of initiation. I said, this is all a hoax. Instead of getting something, I've lost everything. So for many years, I was not even bothered about meditating. I said, I'll have to find out what else is there. I've never tried. My father is following him, I've fallen for him. Not a good way to find truth. So many years I did research, and that's the time when I was in college, and I was trying all kinds of yoga as path, meeting different masters and so on. But I think I was only about 11 or 12 years old. And we were playing in the field, in the day right itself. And great master's car came. And he stopped. We were playing a game in Punjabi, it's called Guli Danda. I don't know if any of you heard of it. It's just that we make a little stick out of the branch of a tree, make a little small stick with the same branch of tree and hit the small stick with the big, it should reach a goal which is set up somewhere. It's like cricket in miniature. <coughs> it's a rural form of uh, baseball game they play. They are more advanced, this is a very elementary which we poor people can play. I was playing that, I was full of dirt and dust and great master, scar stopped and I went close by to see him, and he said, Ishwar, get in. So I was surprised. He says, get in. So I tried to open the door of the car. I could not. It looked too tight. So he slid inside the seat, 
and opened the door from inside. I said, get in. So I jumped in. He said, I am going to Lahore, which is 20, 30 miles away, for his hot son, come back today. You will come along with me. And he banged the door close. And I was caught tight between the door and him. There was a lot of space on the other side. I said, he will now move to the center or on his side. He didn't. Why am I squashed here? Uh, I said, I can't uh, tell him, please move. He's master. Uh, I don't know what the, uh, why he's doing this. <coughs> and he's very calm and sitting quietly in the center of the back seat. After some time, he just does like this to his beard and virtually falls asleep like this. And his head falls on my dirty shoulders. I see he's trying to rest. But he's resting in the wrong place on my shoulders. I said, should I now wake him up and tell him, no, no, this is not clean. I am, I've been sitting in the dirt and dust. Please, your white beard, beautiful white clean beard is falling over here. I could see. I said, but then I'm disturbing him. Should I disturb him, not disturb him? I was totally confused. What is the right thing for me to do? I can't decide. And as I was all in this confusion, we reached the destination. And he just did like this and said, now I have to go and talk and make sure when I finish my talk, you come, when I start getting up, you run and get into the car, we'll return immediately. I said, yes, master. So he got out. I am puzzled what happened, somewhat confused. And since I kept my arm straight for him, it was all numb. And my shoulder was numb. I said, something has happened here. I come back and he got up and went straight to the car. By the time I ran back, he was already in the car. So I decided to go on the other side, not take the risk. <laughs> so I went to the other side, tried to open the door of the car. I couldn't open it. He slid that way and opened the door. Get in. I got in. No, it's this, sir. As we left, he said, mm. and now this shoulder. <laughs> I thought momentarily there's some method in the madness. It couldn't happen twice on two different shoulders. <coughs> What's going on? Anyway, it was a short journey. We came back. Ever since then, I've tried to touch my shoulders to see if they're really mine, and they're not. It took me many years to discover what had happened to my shoulders. He made them so strong that I could take on anything on my shoulders. During my careers in different jobs, I could take any responsibility, ask my deputies, do this work, fire your guns, use my shoulders. I would talk like that. The shoulders that he strengthened on one trip, the strength has never gone till today. I, I think of it often. I could never understand that such a thing had ever happened to a human being. And it happened to me. And he expressed himself. He expressed his love. He expressed how much he cares by such a simple thing as this. I'm telling you these stories just because you should know it's not some a theoretical thing. His relationship with the perfect living master, very practical, life-changing thing. It's practical, it changes everything in you. It touches your soul, not your mind so much. Sometimes mind is also affected. And your body is affected because mind has all the control over the body. When you realize what master gives us in so many ways, so I can tell you thousands of stories today, mine and others, experiences with great master. But it is just to illustrate the importance of a relationship. It's a friendship that never breaks. It's a friendship that if you just follow simple mechanical method of going inside and seeing the master inside, you, dis you discover 
it's a friendship that lasts forever way beyond this body way beyond your sense perception body way beyond your mind and with your soul it's a soul to soul connection and it can be discovered if you go only up to the light at the third eye center you will see your master there we call it the radiant form of the master because it can be seen even in darkness therefore we call it radiant not that some lights are going out from the master's image same image you can see inside and that image never leaves you the real master is inside physical bodies master dies i we die that's not the relationship with the perfectly we must the relationship is of an immortal soul with an immortal soul and a permanent friendship that never breaks away that's the relationship we have with the perfectly we must i'm very happy to share these stories with you i'm very happy to see all of you uh, thank you very much for joining me again and there are some people who have asked for personal time i'll see them now and this this is the end of the two day event i wish you all god speed i wish you you have safe journeys to your places where you come from and i hope to see you all again thank you very much for your patience god bless you